Welcome back, everybody. Today we're going to talk about the moment of inertia, which moment of inertia I is equal to the second moment of area. It means if we take all of the little bits and bobs across this entire face and we integrate in the x direction and the y direction, the y distance back to the centroid or the neutral axis in the direction that we're interested in, because this I is actually a directional property. Technically, I should have a coordinate system here. For shame, my statics professor would kill me. All right, so we've got here a moment about the x-axis. So x, x is going to be this I, x, x here. And we could also potentially do a moment of inertia or a second moment of area about a y-axis that would be more reasonably centered here for this basic discussion. Um, the moment of inertia is half of the stiffness of the bending of a beam. So any beam bending formulas you're going to find, such as the maximum deflection of a simply supported beam, remember a simply supported beam looks like this where we've got a roller under one end and a pin support on the other. If we take this and we apply a uniform load, which I should use my colors for, we apply a uniform distributed load W to this beam. And this beam has a length, got a coordinate system as well. This beam has a length of L. We've got just about everything we need to tell what the maximum deflection is going to be. This thing is going to sag in the middle. And this maximum deflection delta max is equal to 5 over 384 WL to the fourth power over EI. And this EI down here, that's the stiffness, the bending stiffness of our beam, right? Length here is the length of the beam. W is the load. This coefficient out here is just determined by integrating all of the boundary conditions of this nonsense. But this EI is the stiffness. This is if we swap out a heavier beam, if we swap in a stiffer material, we'll get a stiffer beam, we'll get less maximum deflection. You can tell I use this formula an awful lot in my daily life. That one is stuck in my brain. But you have other deflection formulas. You've got the point load on the end of a cantilever. I'm not going to try to recite that one because I'll probably screw it. Okay, I'll try it. Uh, delta max for that. PL cubed over 48 EI question mark, question mark, question mark. Let me know in the comments below if I screwed that one up. Otherwise, I will leave a comment as well if I screwed that up to be confirmed. I don't do cantilevers that often. Cantilever point load. But what I can tell you is it's got this same shape. You've got a load, you've got a, a span distance. You've got the length of the beam. And then you've got this same EI. So We've got E is our Young's modulus. It is a material property. It's how stiff the material is. So for steel, any steel, or just about any steel, it's 29,000 KSI. For aluminum, which is what I work in most of the time, we've got 10,000 KSI. And I apologize to you, those of you who work metric I don't remember the GPA off the top of my head for the conversions here, but what I can tell you is that that's for any steel, whether it's rebar, A36, uh, A500, it, it doesn't matter. Almost any steel, unless you start getting into really exotic alloys, is 29,000 KSI. Aluminum, similar, similarly, whether I'm working with 3003H32 plate 
or 60, 61, T6, extrusions, 60, 63. This is an architectural alloy. It anodizes much prettier and is not quite as strong, but that's frequently used for curtain wall, windows, things like that. Anyway, E is the material half. Material stiffness. And I, that second moment area, and pretty much no one does this integration by hand anymore. There are programs that can do this for you. I recommend uh, Shape Builder. It's what we use in the office. It's from IES. Um, SolidWorks can generate those. AutoCAD can also do it. It won't give you quite as many section properties. But when you've got a simple shape, when you've got a box, say you've got our, our example beam up here. For this particular situation, I is just equal to BH cubed over 12. And that's just how that is used. If it's about some axis over here that's further away, then there would also be an area term. So if we were trying to take it about this axis, we're switching around the B and the H because we're going this way instead of this way. So I call this Y prime over here. I Y prime Y prime is going to equal H B cubed over 12 plus there's an area and then a distance to the centroid. So we'll do A times distance X squared. So depending on the shape that you've got, this distance portion can come in and be much stronger and kind of bury this little portion here. Um, an example would be when you've got a reinforced concrete beam where this might have a neutral axis up here. This is concrete. Speckle it a little bit. But we've also got some rebar down here. And for those of you who don't know, the way that we look at concrete, you end up with this stress block. Stress block. That takes the compression. So we're looking at bending it like this. And then we've got the steel down here. We totally ignore all of this steel, all of this concrete that's in tension because concrete tension bad. It's got a minuscule cracking load. It's basically there just to get the load down to the steel. And then this steel is giving us the tension resistance. And when we're working on the stiffness of this beam, we totally ignore whatever, whatever uh, the circle equivalent of this BH cubed term is. And we pretty much just do A times D squared for that one. So don't try to work this formula by hand. What you can do and what used to get done around my office before I was around, back before computers were widespread, we frequently work with very oddly shaped sections in the curtain wall industry. Some nice stick built stuff kind of looks like this where you've got a rectangular tube and you've got this little tongue and this little rectangle and you can go through and you can treat this as a bunch of different little squares if you want to and manually find the center of gravity of the entire shape or if you've got a shape like this where you've got the advantage of symmetry or not symmetry you've got the advantage of some shapes that you can work with you can pretty readily come up with what would be the moment of inertia for that chunk and for this rectangle and then you can subtract out 
it does work like this. You can subtract out the moment of inertia for these red rectangles to get to what you would have there. So when you are working the moments of inertia of an I-beam, we're going to scrap that sheet. When you're working the moments of inertia for an I-beam, and we'll see how bad I am at drawing here yet again. I need to get smart and pre-print some of these drawings. We've got this I-beam. I We've got a height here that is H. We've got a flange width that is B. And for the sake of making this all easy, we're going to say that these are all thickness T. So we've got options. We can either break this up and make the addition of this chunk, this chunk, and this chunk using the overall centroid, which coincides with the centroid of this middle one, if these are symmetric and then also the little centroids from each one of these guys. Or we've got the alternative option of we can make this as one big rectangle. Then we can subtract off these two smaller ones. Either option is acceptable. You're going to get the same answer. So running this real quick, I'm going to take this route just so that we can see, because this one, all the area team, all of the distance terms are going to go to zero again. I is equal to, in this case, the sum of the B H cubed over 12 plus a d squared. All right, so I'm going to do this, and I'm claiming that these two are the same. So we're going to get ourselves, let's see, for the center section here, we've got i equals. So our width is t, our height is h minus 2t cubed over 12 plus 0 because we've got no distance to our middle centroid here. We know that the center of gravity for the entire shape is at the same spot as this middle rectangle, so this distance term would be 0. Then, because the top and bottom are the same thing, we're going to go times 2. We're going to go, our width here is B, our height is T, so that's our BH cubed over 12, plus we need an area term, which is going to be B times T, and we need our distance term, which is going to be H over 2 minus t over 2 squared like that. And I'm not going to go through the, the lovely task of simplifying that, but with real numbers, this is a chunk you can put in your calculator. That's a chunk you can put in your calculator. That's a chunk you can put in your calculator and you can simplify on down from there. So it's pretty easy to work through. But again, if you start getting into some really weird shapes where maybe it looks like what many storefront shapes have, where you've got uh, maybe a screw spline going on here. And we'll say there's a screw spline here. Wow, that's an ugly screw spline. Don't extrude that. So you got that, and you would have another piece here that snaps in. The glass would come in here, whatever. This is an ugly shape. And this, back in the day, the guys in my office would have come through 
and drawn this thing up on graph paper and manually tabulated all the little squares that they could try to chunk this up into. And if you've got circles or triangles or other known shapes that have easy to look up uh, moments of inertia, you could also use those to break it down. But you just break it down into elementary shapes that you can then work the math for. And you go from there. This is actually very similar to how the computer does it. Computer's just going to go through and make a ton of tiny little squares or triangles or rectangles or circles. And it's going to find the center of gravity of all of that. That's probably not quite right. It's probably a little further left here, but it's going to find the center of gravity. And then for each and every one of these, it's going to take this little guy and do the width. I don't know. We'll call them deltas with delta h delta cubed over 12 plus a delta d delta squared. And it's going to sum them up. So that's very similar to what we're doing here. It's just going to take you reams of notebook paper to get through. And you're going to screw up somewhere if you're anything like me. So that's that. If you spot any errors, please comment below so I can fix them. I'll add text boxes if anything came up that was wrong. If you are studying up for the PE, the FE, the SE exams, check out the link below that's going to get you 15% off over at uh, PPI2Pass. They're who I use for all of my exam prep. Um, and as always, like, subscribe, share. Please help me grow. I really appreciate it, guys. Thank you.